You are now listening to the smooth sounds of Love Atia. Ciao, beautiful souls. My name's Atia, and I am your future bestie in your head. I am a sex positive animal activist. I grew up in Queens, New York, and was homeschooled slash unschooled for about 12 years. I was a virgin until I was 24 and attempted to have a hoe phase for two years, which eventually led me to being accidentally slash intentionally celibate. And here we are today. My past left me with a lot of wild stories, a lot of lessons, and a hell of a lot of trauma. Thank God for my wicked sense of humor because God only knows I would have perished by now. With that being said, this is your gentle reminder that the Love Atia experience was created as a safe space for me to reflect and share the lessons that I've learned from past trauma. Shit gets real on this podcast in topics such as domestic violence, sexual assault, substance abuse, depression, anxiety, and suicide may be referenced. If you are working through feeling triggered by certain topics, this may not be the show for you right now, and that's okay. Healing takes time and isn't linear. I'll be here when you're ready. Now, without further ado, the Love Atia experience is an experience. So get ready for laughs, crazy story times, and life-changing pleasure tips here on the Love Atia experience Yo, podcast. Yo, hola, 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 hola. I wonder how you say your in Spanish. I'm going to Google it. But what's up, y'all? Welcome to the motherfucking Love It Tia experience. Guess who it is? Motherfucking Love It Tia. <laughs> I'm in a silly, goofy mood today. I um I woke up at like 6 a.m. Because what the fuck? And then I went back to sleep because that's crazy. And then I woke up at 11 a.m. But I'm so excited because it is episode 20. We made it, y'all. I, I heard that people quit podcasting around episode 7. If you get to episode 10, you reach the threshold. Episode 20, I'm in this for life. So, yeah, I'm super excited. Thank y'all so much for being here with me on this journey. The numbers, the numbers are doing great. I'm so grateful for all of the support. I'm so thankful for all of the DMs. I got a DM the other day, and it was um a beautiful soul that was telling me that They were literally looking for a podcast like mine and came across my podcast, I'm guessing from one of my promotions, and were so happy that they like manifested finding it. So things like that really do like motivate me and keep me going. And yeah, I I have so much fun. Today's episode is actually going to be, I think I'm going to title it Act Like You're My Therapist because I'm going to talk to my therapist about this uh, this week, but I don't know. I just want to kind of talk through it with y'all before I um, bring her my spark notes. (laughs) Because I have a lot to say about it. And, you know, I feel like I really, this this celibacy journey has really been um, reframing my mind a lot when it comes to the way that I look at sex, the way that I look at intimacy and connection and my pussy power and all that good stuff. So I just want to talk about that. Uh, if I think of a random story, like a crazy story to tell y'all, I mean, I still have a couple of stories I could tell you, but I will definitely um, put that at the end. You already know. We got to do a catch up in the beginning. Um, I want to tell y'all about some new rules that I have when it comes to sex. And then I want to talk about shooting my friendship shot. Because how does that look? Um, I want to talk about intimacy over sex or intimacy versus sex. Because I know that when I first started my platform, uh, or really talking about like really being in this niche of sex education, I uh, talked a lot more about sex. And over time, my content has gone more towards pleasure because I stopped having sex. Then <laughs> I wasn't getting pleasure from sex. So I felt like pleasure was a thing I needed to be talking about. So I just want to talk about intimacy over sex. And also, you need to talk about niggas in my DMs because I'm posting a PSA this week and I just need to be known like, stop, stop. All right. So first with the catch up. Y'all know that I am living out the country. If you don't know this by now, then at this point, you have just just, just banned this from your mind because I've mentioned it in almost every episode. But I survived my first four-day weekend here from Thursday to Sunday. And, well, Monday morning, really. I never want to be the person that's like, oh, you know, I'm getting older. Like, I'm about to be in my 30s. I'm getting so old. Like, I never, ever, ever want to be that person because I've been surrounded by people who have been older and have spoken their age into their existence. But all I'm going to say is I am not 21 anymore. There is a big fucking gap between 21 and 28. I'll tell you that shit right now. And I was not prepared for it. My body hurts. My throat's fucking sore. It's not my, my throat is even sore. My throat, I just don't have a voice. I don't, I like, I just, I'm tired. Like, I'm literally exhausted. I'm exhausted. Um, and my social battery 
was at a 4.5, literally a four fucking point five. Um, I love everybody that I was around. Like literally I was around, I want to say four people this weekend and everybody was like, it was an equal energy exchange for every single person, which is why I was able to go out every night (laughs) because I didn't feel like I was depleted by the end of each night, but it's just like physically and like, I don't even know emotion not even emotionally just really more physically and mentally i'm exhausted yo i need to talk about like how i cannot believe that okay wait let me put this on my list of things to talk about because i'm trying to stay on track okay never again okay just wrote that down we'll come back to that all right so i need to clarify a couple of things because if you have me on instagram if you don't have me on instagram what the fuck are you doing have me on Instagram. You get a sneak peek of my whole life. It's love a Tia. But if you do have me on Instagram, thank you so much for your support. And you have probably seen my story of me coming home at 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday night. Also came home at 8 o'clock in the morning on Sunday night. But it's so funny because I had my panties in my hand. No, I didn't. I did not. I did not. I did not. I rebuked that. I did not have my panties in my hand. I had my t-shirt in my hand. Because I told you that the girl tried to beat me up in the middle of the club because I took my shirt off in front of her boyfriend. So I had a bra on. Wait, did I tell y'all how my friend drove me, like, on his ATV? Did I tell y'all about that part? I feel like I need to go back and listen to the last episode to see, like, what I really told y'all. But, yeah, I got a ride on an ATV for my friend um, who owns one here. And that was my first time, I think, ever on an ATV. I think that on all the vacations I've been on, I don't think I've ever ridden on an ATV. When I tell you that shit, when I got off the ATV, right, I was like, yeah, like, my feet were vibrating. My feet were vibrating. No, bitch, my pussy was like why does nobody say that like literally that shit is like a you're sitting on a vibrator it literally that's basically how it feels like i'm not even trying to be funny right now i'm not even trying to be like inappropriate i'm just being straight up like that shit literally vibrates your whole fucking like vulva this shit is crazy i think i was just too drunk to really realize it because i was so focused on my feet i mean i shit you already know i love i love my feet being vibrated through you know anything with my feet but yeah that shit was a crazy ass experience so anyways shout out to my friend for uh, putting me onto that but (laughs) so if y'all see me driving on atv from here on out you you know what it is <laughs> but no in all seriousness um that was really a fun ass night but everybody thought that i came home with my panties in my hand no y'all that was that's so 2021 me 2022 me maybe <laughs> wait when did i go to mexico on that trip 2021 yeah okay that was so 2021 me walking out of rooms with panties in my hand but no i um i I had, a, like, a very pure weekend, I will say. Like, I was very respected amongst... You know, I was hanging out with guys, um, but I was very respected amongst the guys. I felt really safe. I was really grateful for that because that's a very rare-ass experience. Um, and very rarely can you be, like, drunk around men and feel like, oh, I'm not going to get taken advantage of. But gratefully, like, I mean, because I've just, I guess, done the work and I've been able to just attract whole pure-hearted non-predatory souls then i um was able to just really genuinely enjoy myself this weekend without having to worry about any of that so no that was not my panties in my hand my friend gave me another shirt to wear um so i didn't have to go home in a taxi in a bra because i told y'all again you know took my shirt off in the club so and what's crazy is the night that i did that i wasn't even as drunk as i was Sunday night. So this is not, that was not no like, oh, she's mad drunk. This was like, I'm going to die if I don't take my shirt off type shit. It was sweltering. So anyways, long story short, no, um, because my friend texted me and was like, were those your panties in your hand? (laughs) I was like, no. (laughs) So anyways, um, definitely had a time. Definitely, definitely um, so grateful. We ended up on the beach somehow on Sunday night. That was crazy. Um, some people were like getting into a fight outside the club. That was crazy. And then they were like, oh, I'm, I'm not even going to tell you this part of the story because you know what? No, I'm going to make like a, a Patreon or some shit where I could really tell y'all the real exclusive shit because I just cannot like, you know, sometimes you want to share shit and then it's like everybody just want to then add their two. So it's like, I fucking knew it. This, that, and the third. So I'm not even going to tell y'all. I'm not even gonna tell y'all, but just know there will be so I'm gonna make like a club or something, some type of membership. Because I had a membership at the beginning of the podcast, but I think I had like two viewers at the time, so <laughs> now I think I could do something to where you can get like an inside scoop. Because I feel like some shit I just don't want to share with the world. We just know it was some mixy shit that happened outside of the club. Um, but we ended up going to the beach and that was a ball. And then uh ended up going to my friend's house, getting even litter. And then uh, me and my other friend walked to get a cab, and that was an, an adventure. We made a sentimental ass video, and then um, ended up sharing the cab, and that was it. That was that was the weekend, really. I mean, like I said, there's so much more, so many more details. But then I ended up going to a basketball game after that um, the next day, and that was lit. I told y'all I've been manifesting a lot lately, so to be able to go to a basketball game abroad 
which is something that I like really want to experience and I didn't realize that I was going to be able to experience it here so yeah I've been to a couple of them actually but I was I had a lot of fun and I brought my mom with me this time so that was really nice I told y'all I started socializing um a little bit more so there were a couple of familiar faces that I had seen at the other basketball games so that was nice to be able to because last time the first two games I went I was isolating the shit out of myself I was sitting on the other side of the court like I just needed to just I guess get my bearings I don't know I just I have not been I had not been in a social mood I just had not been so that was that um and that was my weekend I mean I I told y'all basically everything in the last episode so yeah it just was basically part two um and yeah I had a lot of fun I also really missed hanging out with like guy friends like that was a really cool experience um and even it's mad funny because I just felt like nor I feel like normally I want I don't want to say normal girls but they don't like I, I feel like they don't like their guy friends like talking to other girls when they're around them I guess that's I don't know I really don't know I guess it's like if they're I don't even fucking know but well, I didn't I didn't give a fuck like if anything I wanted to be a wingman I wanted to either be there and like help or like be away but I feel like when I was there like I would always distract the girl and then the girl would end up asking for my Instagram and shit so I'm like okay maybe if I just like stand in the corner like I cannot not like cock block accidentally so so yeah that was cool I felt like I just felt like I was super evolved because I feel like even back in the day like I'm, I'm pretty sure I used to be pretty um territorial over my friends you know what I'm saying so like and that's that's weird like you can't be territorial over people you know what I'm saying and I'm, I feel like my relationship really taught me about possession and how possession is the most unhealthy fucking experience I hate feeling possessed i am literally no one's property i am for everybody no i'm just kidding i'm not for everybody but yeah like i hate that shit so yeah i was just it was just i just feel like this weekend was like a really good weekend for me to like progress and like not even progress but just to see my progression and to see my healing and i'm really grateful for that with that being said i came up with some new rules when it comes to sex because i realized like i don't have um anything set in stone when it comes to how to handle my celibacy journey and you know i always want to make sure that i'm um protecting my heart protecting my energy protecting my mind and even being super lit last night like i said like i mean i was not last night but i was grateful that i was around guys like i could trust but sometimes you're not always going to be that lucky there are still assholes in the world you know so i realized that i need to come up with some hardcore boundaries and some i guess not deal breakers but yeah just boundaries so the first one uh to protect myself is going to be no sex when i'm drunk unless i decided i wanted to have sex with the person before i had a drink to my mouth uh and that's that's pretty simple i mean like i said the time that i had um that I told y'all there's like the story and then I was going to tell y'all and then it ended up being like literal sexual assault and just the coercion behind it all. I was super drunk. And so, you know, my decision making was not all that. I feel like if it's ever a fuck it, uh, fuck it's don't always work out for me. Fuck it's work out for me. Fuck it's don't work out for me more than they do work out for me. So especially when it comes to sex. So yeah, there's ever a moment where I'm just like drunk and I'm like, fuck it. Like, no, 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 no. It's a no. Like, I, I just want to make sure that I just have that boundary set in place. So there's that. Um, and for anybody wondering, still celibate. Like, I don't know. I, like I said, people thought I had panties in my hands. So I just need to clarify that. Um, also, I, I heard this one on, I think the podcast is called Not Your Average Sex Podcast. But taking a pause before agreeing to anything. So even if I'm sober, taking a moment. You know, especially when it comes to sex and evaluating my body, evaluating my mind, making sure that I'm not just being rash or coming from a place of limitation. Because even the guy that I had sex with um, last year, last year, January, uh, and, and then I realized that it was just like sexual assault. I realized that one of the reasons why I think that I said yes, besides the coercion, besides the... I don't even know, besides the the pressure that I, the immense fucking pressure that I felt in that moment was also in like him being mad, you know, I think it was also a, a, a thought of lack, like, well, I don't really know the next time that I'll be able to have sex, so I guess I'll just have it since it's presented itself to me, but no, like, look, it does, that, even, that doesn't even sound right to come out my mouth, like, 
And then the craziest part is then I had sex with a guy right after that that I actually did really want to have sex with. So, yeah, I realized that, you know, just making sure that my judgment is all the way there when it comes to not coming from a place of lack, making sure that I really want to, making sure that it's not just because my hormones are raging, you know. I got vibrators. I bought more vibrators home with me from this last trip to Atlanta. I have enough to be able to get me through until I really, like, I'm willing to have sex with somebody and really want to. And it's a hell yes. Like, it needs to always be a hell yes. And that is my next one. And I got this from Cammy's um, podcast. The, I think it's called Relationship with Cammy. Um, but I think the episode is called, like, it has to be a hell yes or something like that. Or what are your hell yeses? But, yeah, if it's not a hell yes, if somebody says, like, yo, do you, like, do I have consent? If I'm like, yeah, sure. No, then that's that's not it. That's not enough for me. That's not and it shouldn't be enough for him. It should be a hell fucking yes. Fuck me gently. Make love to my body and soul, cause I want to know. That's my song by Nina Baker. Um, okay. Last but not least, my other rule is no shame, no regrets. So for the times that I do explore my sexuality, whether it be even just non non sexual things, even if it's just forms of intimacy or, or sharing a connection with somebody or kisses, long hugs, whatever the case may be. Like, I sometimes I put so many, so many other rules and thoughts behind it. And I think that that really does stem from like societal shame. I, I posted a status one time or a video one time on TikTok and it was about sex and how I felt like, you know, the shame and stigma surrounding sex for women was so much more than the shame and stigma surrounding sex for men and somebody commented and said you can't feel shame and stigma arrest that's something you already feel shame in and i was like what <laughs> it's like you, I, society literally puts places so much shame on women we can't even show our fucking nipples we can show the side of our titties the front of our titties the tops of our titties but we god for fucking bid we show the nipple like it doesn't make sense it's literally there's shame embedded in us from birth no matter how sex positive our parents are like there's literal shame everywhere in the school systems on on tv and the billboards and religion so it's there and so i realized that even as sex positive as i am and as pleasure positive as i am I still have so many boundaries to break, so many places of shame that I feel like I um I place upon myself and it's not fair. So I'm really working on that and let, allowing myself to be in the moment. But even, you know, just I think with these other boundaries in place, like these four specific boundaries, I think that this will help me um have a great time when it comes to exploring myself sexually while not walking away with shame and regret. So I'm really grateful for that. And yeah, yeah, really, I feel like that was something I just wanted to share with y'all when it comes to creating sexual boundaries. And it doesn't have to be this long laundry list. It's just four things. And they're very simple and very easy for me to remember. Hell yeah take up it gotta be a hell yes take a pause before making an agreement no sex when i'm drunk unless i decided that i want to have sex before i was drunk when i was in a sober state of mind and last but not least is i forgot this one fuck i just said oh i didn't forget no shame and regrets but that makes sense but that was just my brain like i haven't programmed that one in for real for real so yeah i'm excited and you know that's my goal with this podcast is to break shame and stigma surrounding sex so there you have it We're, we're on this ride together Next up is shooting my friendship shot, right? Okay, so there are some people that I peep have peeped me on social media. That's the only way I really know how to say it. I mean, like, you know, you just peep that some people are like looking at your story or looking at whatever. And so I have then gone and looked on their page and realized like, oh, wow, this person looks super dope. And so I would like to shoot my shot. But as a friend, one, because the places where these people are from i.e my hometown are very mixy places and so i've i've told myself that i have retired from wait can we talk about homie hopping in this episode let's talk about that i'm adding that to my list homie hopping okay but you know i told myself that it's just it just has to be organic when it comes to a romantic connection like i'm just done but i am down for having some friendships that organically grow but like i feel like can i plant the seed at least like how does that work how how does planting the seed work with that being said let's talk about homie hopping i have mixed reviews and mixed emotions about homie hopping right okay so back in the day like i said when i used to be very uh territorial about people I I was like, this person is like hands off. Like, for instance, 
If I would know that somebody I knew talked to my ex right after I I was dating him, if it was me last year, I would probably very much so give a fuck. Like, I feel like you have no fucking loyalty, you ratchet, ugly, fugly bitch. Um, Because there have been people who I've thought, like, have always wanted to talk to him, but just didn't because me and him were talking. Um, or who might have even fucked around with him while we were talking because people ain't shit, you know? Um, but now I'm like, shit, <laughs> I tried to talk to one of his friends. So, you know, <laughs> we're even, brother. <laughs> we are even. But, um, but no, in all seriousness, even though I was being very serious, I do feel as though the world is so fucking small Atlanta and Queens are so fucking small that it's pretty hard not to talk to somebody who may be homies with somebody who you once talked to. I just have to say it. And I also feel like, you know, I can't be contradictory. So like I said, if I want people to be okay with me talking to their friends, I need to be okay with them talking to my friends. But, you know, there's been such like this fucked up shit about homie hopping. It's like when you when you're fucking with one friend and then you meet his group of friends, and you're like, fuck, I got the wrong one. And it's not even about looks it's about connection and what they have going for them you know it's like if you go for the bummy friend and then you realize that he's the only nigga in his group without ambition like fuck uh, i did I, th- I didn't know that that it was an option to be with a man with ambition like this was me back in the day so you know i told y'all that i i have accidentally homie hopped uh to be like i didn't know that this person was close friends with this like I, i'm like oh, okay yeah like i know you probably know them like i mean we're all from the same place but for you to like really fuck with them like that's your man's like oh and then like even my last my last story about the hotel room and like oh like we're literally fucking next to the guy that i used to mess around with luckily i was a virgin so he can never say that he got this pussy for real for real but yeah i um i mean anything just his mouth was on it you know it's like (laughs) that's it but i mean yeah i just feel like time passes people change you realize people ain't shit and it's okay to move on to their friend who you realize is is the shit but at the same time, like, maybe that's just because, oh, again, like, I'm not on some possessive shit. But is it bad? Like, do you think that it's bad to be a homie hopper? Do you feel like it depends on who the friend is? Like, okay, if it's my best friend who's talking to my ex, it's like, bitch, did you have feelings for him this whole time? Because then I just feel, like, low-key betrayed. But at the same time, I'm like, I know he puts his hands on women. So, like, let me just give you a fucking warning. But shit, maybe, I mean, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you know, I know what you're getting yourself into. Like, that sounds fucked up, but it's true. Like, I know that he ain't shit. I know that he's going to cheat on you because he cheated on me and his ex. He cheated on his ex with me. Probably cheated on me with his ex. Who knows? Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe another ex. So, yeah, I'm just saying, like, you know, at the same time, it's like when you know that somebody ain't shit, if somebody wants him go for him and then you're like well should i give her a warning i mean i would probably give my people a warning because the guys i talked to really were not shit but you know you sometimes you think like, maybe they just were shit to me but mm, once not shit always not shit my personal opinion but people might say that about me but i don't feel like i was ever not shit i feel like i was just traumatized but these persons are genuinely not shit like these people they're probably also traumatized but they've then made that trauma make them become like fully un unshit like ain't shit in their whole entire lives you get what i'm saying my point is is that i don't think that homie hopping is bad i don't think that it's bad at all i think that if enough time has gone by i don't think you should be a rebound i don't think that i should talk to your friend and then a week later i talk to you i've also had gotten in trouble with homie hopping like i've I've been with one person, really liked that person, and then their friend cock blocked us, like the Mexico situation. And then that ends up being a totally different thing because they wanted you that whole time. So, and if you don't know the Mexico story, you can go back and listen to it. It's, it's a three fucking parter, y'all. But, anyways, more tea about that later on in life. But yeah, I just I just feel like homie hopping is okay. I feel like men made up that term to try to shame women and make them feel stuck with like and maybe i'm wrong but i mean i don't really know of many women to use that term in regards to their friends i mean shit i mean i hang around some bad bitches so i wouldn't be surprised if like one of the people that i mess with would want to talk to one of my friends like they're bad but like i said i think it depends on the the variation of the friendship like how close are we because if you're again my best friend are you talking to you talking to the guy i just stopped talking to like the fuck and I wouldn't do that either. Like, if I, if I knew that one of my girlfriends was talking to a guy and, like, really liked him. So, I guess, damn, now that I think about it. But I guess if you don't know that that person liked them. Like, for instance, 
in the hotel situation, like, I don't think that footsies knew that, knew what the extent of me and Panda's situationship was. I mean, I told him that we used to fuck around, but, like, but then, yeah, that was when I was 20 fucking one. Like, I was 27 when me and footsies met. That's six goddamn years. Like, I feel like that's okay. I feel like it is totally okay to mess with my friends after six years, especially when Panda did treat me like I wasn't shit. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. I guess it depends on how the situation ends, what what that person is to the other person. It's just mad different scenarios. So so I feel that. I do. But I will say that, I mean, shit, I always wanted to have an MMF threesome. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, if one thing leads to another, you know what I'm saying? Shit, I don't know. I don't know if y'all seen Saint X. If you haven't, oh my God, that was like my wildest fantasy. I was like, you go, girl. And then she got him fucked up. And I was like, fuck you, bitch. But we can talk about that. We can have a, a, a day where we talk about TV shows. But not yet because there's the SAG strike going on. So I don't think I can promote any shows until then. But I mean, until there's some vindication on behalf of SAG and the Actors Union and the Writers Union. Shout out to them, for real, for real. But yeah, I um I, I have always wanted to have an MMF threesome. Um, and I never really wanted to have a male, female, female threesome. Um, but I would want to have a all girl threesome and I would want to have a two guy, one girl threesome. So just putting that out there for the future, for future rendezvous. Um, okay. Next up, we're going to talk about intimacy over sex. Intimacy over sex, intimacy over sex, intimacy over sex, intimacy over sex. Welcome to my new segment, intimacy over sex. Welcome to the- Welcome to my new segment where we talk about intimacy over sex. So basically, this is going to be a quick one because that's it. <laughs> no, I just I just realized that I've gotten off more from intimacy than I have from s- penetrative sex. Well, before I talk about that, I do want to give a shout out to this fucking vibrator, the Hitachi, I'm sorry, the magic wand. <laughs> Y'all, I brought it back with me from Atlanta. So the Hitachi, if you don't know, was the vibrator that my mom got me when I was 16 years old. Yes, I still have a vibrator from when I was 16 years old. Get off my vulva. But I say all that to say that the store, uh, Shador, aka shopsador.com, has it on their website. And so I like to put people on because I'm not a gatekeeper. And so I 10 out of 10 recommend whether you are an advanced masturbator or a new masturbator. I don't care. The Hitachi is always going to be number one in my life, for real. Always going to be my favorite. Two settings. I I have the one that plugs in. I prefer that one as opposed to the rechargeable ones. But you can do the rechargeable one as well. I think I just prefer that one because it's just OG. You don't have to worry about charging it. But you can do either or. And if you use the code LOVEATIA, you'll get 15% off. It's really worth it. And the fact that it's literally lasted me 12 years, it's worth the investment. Like, just know not all sex toys last that long. So, and I've I've used this baby down. All right? All right. So, yeah, they have it at Sador. You can head to shopsador.com and get it. 10 out of 10 recommend. Thank me later. I'm telling you, I don't care what vibrators you have. If you don't have a Hitachi, you're not living life. So yeah, use the code LOVEATIA and get 15% off my loves. But with that being said, sexually, you know, like sex is cool. But as you know, I had a really long stint of disassociating during sex. But intimacy, because I've had to then be connected with the person, which means eye gazing, kissing, neck shit, ear shit. Um, touching the smalls of my back, you know, like feeling somebody's hands on my body, shit like that, like to where it's helping me get in my body and it's really close. I've always loved closeness, even when I'm having sex. If we're having sex, but you're far away, it just does, I just don't feel connected. But if we're having sex and you're like right on top of me, I love that shit. Like I really love that shit. Even the day that I told y'all I, I came from um, riding the dick, being on top that time, I was sober. That was amazing because right, I think when we were both about to come at the same time, he like pulled me in and my chest was on top of his chest. Then we had like this thrust thing going and that shit ooh, was the best major flashbacks just now. I can't even lie, but that shit was the best. So yeah, it's just the closeness. It's just so fucking, I just live for intimacy and I feel like I need to feel really safe when I have sex as do a lot of people, as should a lot of people. So 
yeah, I, I realized that there are other ways I can get that besides just those things. I think that even intimate conversations with people. I mean, I've had times where I've been like out and drunk and wanted to like drunk text guys, you know, but I feel like when I was out with my guy friends and like just having a good time, like our conversations were so fucking good. Like I didn't feel the need to escape the moment. Like I was good right there, you know, shit like that, like fucking taking walks, reading books, going to the beach, um, like sun gazing, um, walking around the pool, just little things like intimate time with myself, writing. I love writing short stories. I love writing long stories. I love writing fucking songs, like things that I can just feel like I can get some creative energy out. That to me is like intimacy within myself. So yeah, the more I can cultivate it within myself, the more I learn how to enjoy it with others. But I can't lie. This is the part where I still like, I need y'all to act like you're my therapist because I'm also at the same time, very scared of intimacy. Anybody else? Like, one, I, I have this perception in my mind of myself to where I just feel like I'm so fucking magical. That like, I don't want you to fall in love with me by accident. Like, don't be falling in love. Like, what's that song? And it's like, don't fall in love. I can't remember, but it's not, it doesn't go like that. But it just has those words. But, oh, it's Christina Aguilera. But don't fall in love. Please don't disturb the signs. Put my back into a slow grind. Ah! That's my shit. I'm about to listen to that after I record this. But it's called um, Let Me Get Mine, You Get Yours. Or Get Mine, Get Yours. That shit is my fucking song. It's off her, uh, off her, is it Stripped? Stripped album, yeah. But as much as I love intimacy, I've realized that my best moments of intimacy have come with people who have also been scared of intimacy. So I usually take the lead on it because I know that they're not going to get all that committed when it comes to me because they're just as scared of it. But when I'm with somebody who's not scared of intimacy and who's not scared of the connection, I get very, very, very intimidated. And I don't really know what that's about. I don't know if I'm scared of hurting feelings. I don't know if I'm scared of... I mean, I know that even back in the day, like, I've held myself back, you know, from being intimate with certain people. Um, There have been other ways that I've known that I could, like, take it up a notch or turn up my pussy power a notch. And I'm like, no, like, I don't want this person to, like... Like I said, like, fucking catch feelings or whatever or catch deep feelings. So, you know, like, I'm like, oh, let me just turn it down or, like, be medium, be mid, basically, when I know that I could take it up with, like, my sexual energy or whatever the case may be. I feel like I've said that 12 times, so bear with me. That's my new like, but or my new exactly. I say it like it exactly a lot, but I'm working on it. It's just something I've, I've noticed, though, about myself in regards to intimacy and the fear of intimacy. I'm probably going to read today. I really look forward to reading something, and hopefully that helps me when it comes to figuring out why I have this fear. And, what, and, and maybe I'll even write about it. Like, what is the worst that could happen? The worst that can happen is that somebody's feelings get hurt, and I guess I just don't want that. So I try to not put myself in situations where that could happen. But I also know that in situations where I do want to, not even, I don't want to use the words get off, but in situations that should normally be orgasmic for me, I'm so in my head about it not being too intimate that I kind of shut myself off from the pleasure at a certain point, if that makes sense. And I wouldn't even say that that's disassociating. I think I just put a barrier up. And so I'm excited to talk to my therapist about this. But if you experience this and know why you experience it, then please feel free to let me know because I'm very curious about it. And as I talk about it, I'm like, wow, I do have a lot, a lot to learn. I don't know if it's about like my attachment issues. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's attachment issues. Maybe I'm scared of being attached. Because one thing I have on my notes for the day is to talk about how, you know, I used to be so heartbroken back in the day. Like, God damn. And I'm looking back at it like, how did I really be? I let these niggas, the ones that I'm thinking of, like, I let them break my heart. Like, what the fuck? So I don't know if it's a little bit of PTSD from that or... I just, I just, I guess I was just so, so fucking attached that now I feel like I'm so detached. And so I'd like to find a a middle ground of that to where I can be in flow. Like I don't, I actually don't want to be attached. I don't think that that, I don't think that attachment is necessarily healthy. I still feel like to me, attachment is the same as possession. It's like, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think? I wish I had a guest on here right now so we could have this conversation. But now that I'm at episode 20, I told you I was going to start having guests. I'm very excited to have my very first guest. And we're going to, I'm literally going to pop this off in 
August. So it's about to be my birthday month. I think that this would be the perfect time to do it in honor of my birthday. But yeah, I'm actually going to read an article that I found and see if this brings any clarity. And you let me know if you feel seen with me reading this article. And we'll read it together because this is my first time reading it. What's crazy is that in the midst of doing my research to find the article, I realized like, okay, maybe I'm on a spectrum when it comes to the fear because they're like, oh, you don't want to share ideas with people. You don't want to talk to people. I'm like, okay, that's not it. But I'm talking about sexual intimacy but let's let's see this is from verywellmind.com and it says fear of intimacy sometimes referred to as intimacy avoidance or avoidance anxiety is characterized as the fear of sharing a close emotional or physical relationship people who experience this fear don't usually wish to avoid intimacy but i'm so sorry y'all can you literally hear the taco truck outside he's literally like on doing an announcement right now as we speak okay is he gone it's getting faded, so I feel like, all right, I couldn't concentrate. All right, people who experience this fear don't usually wish to avoid intimacy and may even long for closeness, but frequently push others away and even sabotage relationships nonetheless. Ooh, not you calling me out. Fear of intimacy can stem from several causes, including certain childhood experiences, such as a history of abuse or neglect. The fear may involve one or more of these types of intimacy in different degrees intellectual the ability to share your thoughts with and ideas with another i can do that emotional the ability to share your innermost feelings with another i can do that sexual the ability to share yourself sexually yeah. <laughs> experiential the ability to share experiences with another i could do that spiritual intimacy the ability to share your beliefs beyond yourself in a higher power or individual connection to others and the world i could do that Okay, overcoming this fear and intimacy can take time. This, I'm sorry, this fear and anxiety can take time, both to explore and understand the contributing issues and to practice allowing greater vulnerability. Okay, so there's the fear of intimacy versus the fear of vulnerability. Those, though the two can be closely intertwined, a person living with the fear of intimacy may be comfortable becoming vulnerable and showing their true self to the world. But there will often be limits to how vulnerable they allow themselves to be. I don't know if I... Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. No, we do need to get this part. Okay. Sometimes I might be giving up on stuff because it's too close to home. But I didn't feel like I could relate to that. But let's see. What causes a fear of intimacy? Fears of abandonment and engulfment and ultimately a fear of loss are at the heart of the fear of intimacy for many people. And these fears can coexist. Although the fears are different from one another, both cause behaviors that ultimately pull the partner in and then push them away again. Ah, okay. I'm hanging in there, y'all. I don't know. This is not me, though. These fears are genuinely... But if it's you, then I hope this helps you. These fears are generally rooted in past childhood experiences and triggered by the here and now of adult relationships this leads to confusion if a person focuses on examining the relationship solely based on the present day circumstances fear of intimacy can be linked to anxiety disorders as well fear of abandonment oh shit no it's oh it's getting here because the next one is fear of engulfment that is fucking me all right Fear of abandonment. Those who are afraid of abandonment worry that their partner will leave them. Their fear often results from the experience of a parent or other important adult figure abandoning the person emotionally or physically as a young child. Okay, relatable. Fear of engulfment. Those who have fear of engulfment are afraid of being controlled, dominated, or losing themselves in a relationship. And this fear sometimes stems from growing up in an enmeshed family which is very interesting to me okay wow i feel very seen in that one all right anxiety disorders the fear of intimacy may also occur as a part of social phobia or social anxiety disorder some experts classify the fear of intimacy as a subset of these conditions people who are afraid of others judgment evaluation or rejection are naturally more likely to shy away from making intimate personal connections in addition some specific phobias, such as a fear of touch, may occur as part of a fear of intimacy. That's very interesting to me. Well, I'll finish this. It says, other people, however, may be comfortable in superficial social situations, numbering their acquaintances and social media, quote unquote, friends in the hundreds, but have no deeply personal relationships at all. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, what I was going to say was, is that when it comes to the anxiety disorder, I feel like I can understand that when it comes to the rejection and stuff like that, because I have 
I told y'all about the guy that literally cut me off when we fell asleep holding hands and then stopped talking to me for two weeks. Like, so I get that that could also be a fear, but I'm trying to think when I'm really, really feeling somebody like that, am I scared of being intimate with them? Not necessarily. I feel like I'm ready to risk it all. Um, okay. I'm going to try to find some more about, what was it called? Fear of engulfment. Shit. I think I found the article y'all. It's called anchorlighttherapy.com or it's from anchorlighttherapy.com. It says fear of abandonment versus fear of engulfment. This was written in April 11, 2023 by the Anchor Light Therapy Collective. Both are intimacy issues. Most of us say that we want to have a loving partner. Connection and belonging are vital to our human experience. But many have deep-seated fears of intimate personal relationships that make it difficult to be in a close relationship. Intimacy issues cause difficulties in developing meaningful romantic relationships with others. It may come as a surprise, but fear of intimacy usually rears its head in relationships that a person cherishes, not those that are superficial. Hmm. I think for me, it's both. The experience of real love often increases our self-defense and raises anxiety as people become vulnerable and people and open themselves up to other people. Types of intimacy we can fear. Intellectual. Okay. Did I read this already? Yeah. I read all those different kinds already. Okay. We got intellectual, emotional, sexual, experiential, and um, spiritual. What causes these fears? Wait, did they copy and paste basically what these other people fucking said? I swear to, I swear to everything I love they did. Right? Am I bugging? Okay, well, let's just go to fear of abandonment. Signs, I mean, signs of fearing abandonment. Preoccupied thoughts of losing their relationship. Attach quickly in a new relationship. Seek relationships that are unhealthy. Oh, God. Shit, I had a fear, I had a fear of abandonment too? Goddamn. Oh, God, the constant need for reassurance that, oh, my God, serial dating shit have had very few long term relationship. Oh, my Jesus. Move on quickly just to ensure they don't get too attached. Aim to please. Ah, It's getting worse. Feel undeserving. Oh, my God. Engage in unwanted sex. Oh, my God. Okay, I'm going to stop replying after everyone, but just know what the fuck. Oh, these are all me. Um, hard to please and overly critical. Stay in relationships no matter how unhealthy they are. Yeah, that's me three fucking years in. Um, find it hard to trust people. Often jealous of everyone their partner meets. Experience intense feelings of separation anxiety. Feelings of worthlessness. Excessively neediness or clinginess. Uh, difficulty trusting others. Wanting to control others. Codependent behaviors. Or going to extreme lengths to preserve a relationship. Huh. <sighs> Jesus. Out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Damn, I feel like I heard like 15 of these. All right, now let's move on to fear of engulfment. And I'm honestly scared to get to this part because <laughs> how much more can I relate? Those who fear engulfment are afraid of being controlled, dominated, or losing themselves in a relationship. Similar to a fear of abandonment, a fear of being engulfed is also learned in childhood. I think we read this in the last one, Um, except it's the flip side of the same coin. Here, a child may have grown up with parents or a family member that had bigger needs than the child, mental illness, disability, substance use, etc. The larger needs of the parent and family overshadowed their experience of childhood. Children in these circumstances may have had to provide emotional and physical support to the caregiver, which is called parentification. (gasps) We have to have a whole episode about parentification because that is a thing. And, you know, I fucking love my parents. And they did, like, the absolute best that they could. I think they did a motherfucking amazing job compared to... (laughs) A lot of other experiences that I've heard of. So I'm really grateful. Like, I'm so grateful even with our trials and tribulations. But I can't lie. Like, I remember being, like, fucking 14, 15, sitting at the fucking, like, table in the middle of them, like, getting a divorce. Um, And I I, I want to say that that was the end, 14 and 15. So I probably had to be more close to, like, 11 or 12. And, like, being a literal mediator in these family meetings that we would call and feel like I had to be the actual adult because nobody else was really acting like an adult in that time. So, yeah, the parification is real. And I did feel like I had to emotionally and physically support my parents. That's fucking crazy. Okay. 
and again, like if they're listening to this, like I love y'all no less. Like it made me who I am today, so I'm grateful for it. But this just makes me feel really seen. And I've been doing a lot of work on purification lately. Um, and that's like some shadow work I was really scared to do, but knew I needed to do it for the last couple of years. So wow, okay. Um, other factors causing this fear are enmeshed families. This is weird. The children were not allowed their own space and boundaries were overstepped or completely avoided. These children are left feeling trapped like they don't have a self-identity and that their needs and wants do not matter. These children often felt misunderstood or unsupported in their dreams and goals. This fear can also stem from caregivers being too constricting, controlling, and domineering or persistent physical or or and domineering or persistent physical or sexual abuse. As verbal abuse and crisis are common with these types of caregivers, fear of criticism, perceived criticism, is sometimes enough to keep folks out of relationships. Shit. Signs of fearing engulfment. Avoid amb- ambivalent ambivalence. Ambivalence or avoidance. Fear of that kindness and love has strings attached. <gasps> We call that transaction in my family, like transactional um, obligations. So damn, fear that love and kindness have strings attached, suffocated by affection, keeping others at arm's distance, feel like they are being intruded on even in healthy relationships, exhaustion when a partner shares emotions or their or others' needs, uh, want to flee when things get hard for their partner, out of fear of becoming their caretaker. Damn, shit, I was a caretaker for three fucking years. Um, assume that they will not be heard or seen. Yeah, I feel that. Fear of exploitation and deprivation. Oof. Intimacy feels like a trap. Desire to have more than one relationship versus committing to just one person. Sheesh. Fear needs of others will ups. What the fuck? Usurp? Up? Usurp? Is that a word? Usurp? Theirs? Did, am I missing? Am I reading that wrong? Is that spelled wrong? Um, is that a word for real? Numbness towards partner or relationship. I definitely have experienced that. Resentment of relationship or partner and difficulty expressing emotions. Wow. Okay, it says how these fears can ruin your intimate relationships. These fears prompt people to do things that cause problems to to form that threaten. Wait. The cause problems to form that threaten the success of their relationship. Such a thing should not sound like it makes sense, but both fear of abandonment and fear of engulfment cause behaviors that ultimately pull the partner in and then push them away again. People can do this by directly sabotaging the relationship or indirectly through self-sabotage to make themselves less desirable. Sabotaging relationships is another way of confirming self-fulfilling prophecies that all relationships are unsafe. Mm. Relationship sabotaging actions, unrealistic expectations for closeness, intentional starting, ar- intentionally starting arguments, not addressing negative emotions, micromanaging your partner's actions and whereabouts, criticism towards your partner, engaging in unhealthy behaviors, holding grudges, putting energy into everything except your partner, not following words with actions, creating situations with the intent of making your partner jealous. What's interesting is that I actually feel like I was on the other side of the spectrum with a lot of these, this last part in my relationship. Like, I wasn't necessarily doing these things, but I was the receiver of it. Okay, next is um, mental health symptoms caused by these fears. Having these adverse events early in life that now cause distress in your intimate relationship are risk factors for many health many mental health symptoms anxiety low self-esteem depression engaging in self-harm behaviors substance use disorder me as fuck post-traumatic stress disorder me as fuck i mean i was basically all those things except for safe self-harm but still i mean i guess thoughts of self-harm is bad enough i mean not i guess it is um developmental challenges in extreme cases personality disorders such as borderline borderline personality disorder or narcissistic personality disorder social anxiety and irritability or anger all right and now we have how to cope with these fears look at your past think about the messages you received in your family and compare these with the messages you should have received accept uncertainty it's important to accept the fact that these That there are no guarantees in life or in human relationships. Express self-compassion. If you truly know and accept your own value and worth as a person, then you know that rejection is not as crushing as it may seem. Silence your inner critic. Rather than accepting that criticism, try to catch yourself casting negative self-judgments. Ask yourself if your inner dialogue is actually yours versus the bad lesson learned in childhood. Ask yourself if there's evidence for that thought actually being true is it a reaction or is it a fact 
Give yourself time. Inevitably, setbacks will happen. Grant yourself forgiveness when this happens and speak kindly to your inner self. Therapy. Yeah, got my therapy soon. Two days. Individual therapy can enable the cultivation of a stable, holistic self-identity along with the capacity to realistically accept others' strengths and flaws. Mm. Okay, therapeutic implications. I don't think I need to read that, but feel free to go to this article. I'm going to link it in my um in my thing, but it just ends with saying, what do you do if your partner's fear of intimacy is causing issues in your relationship? If you want to stick it out, support them as they are on their healing journey. You can set a boundary that you would like your partner to go to therapy mm-hmm, to work on their fears. As they are healing, practice patience. Setbacks are perfectly normal and to be expected as long as there is accountability from your partner. Establishing safety and trust for your partner is the utmost importance so that your loved one can begin to open up. Try to not react personally or with anger if your loved one tries to push you away don't assume your partner feels loved rather create an environment that supports the fact that they are deserving of it Oof. yeah i'm gonna put this in my description if y'all want to read it you can um but yeah that was eye-opening for me granted like you know i feel like my relationship was what it was because of me and my partner's upbringing we we definitely like triggered each other's inner child and i feel like we were like attracted to each other's inner child like our inner child was what made us come together in the first place but then the unhealed part of our inner child was triggering as fuck on both sides so that's really interesting um, I don't know about you, but I feel like I need a blunt. And if I was to get a blunt, I would get that from Heaven High NYC. And that is my favorite edible company ever. Not only do they have edibles, and I mean like the best, most tastiest edibles, you have to stop yourself from finishing the whole goddamn thing. One, because you're going to get so high, beautifully high, but not like that ick high, like mad great high. And two, because um, I forgot what I was going to say, but because I was like, why did I say mad great high? But two, they also have other forms of plant medicine, just like cyclocillin, gummies, uh, vapes, actual plants themselves. You know what I'm saying? A little sweet, sweet. Well, I don't know. I feel like sweet is a bad term, but weed, they have like legit the best strains that I have ever smoked. And I mean it when I say that the last time I smoked something from heaven high, which was, I want to say two weeks ago when I was back in Atlanta, I was walking on sunshine to say the least. It was, I felt like I was high for the first time again. Seriously, it was amazing. So, yeah, head to heavenhighnyc.com and let them know that Love It Tia sent you. Also, if you are into beautifully handmade jewelry, and I'm not talking about that shit you get from Claire's, I'm talking about some real fine jewelry that is handmade with actual love. I actually had a pair of jewelry go viral on TikTok. They were made of sterling silver, they were sterling silver hoops, and they had a third eye and a jinyama. And if you see, you know, I have like that upper hole ear piercing and then I have like a lower hole ear piercing. So I wear these things called double singles and those are unique and are made by Imani Jewelry. And yeah, like 10 out of 10, I get compliments on them all the time. I have one from their Pride collection that was amazing, but you can use the code LOVEATIA and get 10% off again. Everything is made with natural stones, natural, I would say natural ingredients, natural materials, 14 karat gold filled metals, sterling silver, all that good stuff. So be sure to head to ImaniJewelry.com and use the code LOVEATIA for 10% off. This next portion of my episode is going to be called Get the Fuck Out of My DMs. No, and seriously, and I think I talked about this in my other episode, but I'm really getting aggravated at this point. Because just when I think I'm having wholesome conversations with people, there these these DMs are turning into not. And it's pissing me off. Oh my god. Okay, so first of all, you know, I talk a lot on social media about sex and pleasure and dissociation and all of that good stuff. But for whatever reason, it makes people feel like it's okay to come in my DMs and whether it be send a dick pic, send an inappropriate comment, tell them what, tell me what they would do to me, this, that, and a third. It's not giving. Like, and I feel like people pick and choose what content they see of mine, right? Because everybody will see, oh, the videos where I talk about sucking dick, but you won't see the videos where I talk about like consent (laughs) and like being celibate for a year and a half and, and not liking like predatory actions you know and i'm not saying that everybody in my dms is a predator but i'm just saying that it's just a bit annoying when people come out of nowhere or even when people say like like okay a a common phrase that a lot of people have had when they've slid in my dm are oh like i can make you feel this that and the third or i can make you feel this way but again you don't see my content where i talk about how i have to have a genuine connection with you before we fuck around and before I can really even get off like that like and how difficult it is for me to get off so I need a safe space to be able to feel like I can get off and how I don't like like overtly sexual advances like why is that so hard so lately I've just been straight up like setting really hard boundaries and you know even in friendships in life in love in 
family, whatever. I've been actively setting boundaries because back in the day, people pleaser me again would be like, oh, what if they don't like me? What if they don't like me when I set this boundary? Nope. Like I said in my last episode, I don't give a fuck. Like, don't like me. Great. Too many people like me. Too many people think that they're going to like me. Like, even when I post, like, my turnips and stuff like that, I think everybody thinks, like, oh, when I see a tea, like, we're going to have this great turnip together. It's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. I am not the turnip master. Like, people are like, oh, we got to turn up together one day. Do we? Do we, though? Do we? Are we sure that's going to be a night like the night like I had with my other friend? Because, like, it's not always guaranteed that it's going to be a great fucking night. Like, it just depends on what your energy is, what my energy is, what the universe wants us to have, you know? Like, so, I don't know. I just, it's just a little bit annoying. Like, that's why I stopped checking my DMs for months. And I'm going to take a major fucking social media detox. That's another thing. Like, a lot of people think, oh, because she's posting on social media, like, she's on there. No, y'all. I have scheduled posts. I'm replying to my text two weeks in a, two weeks after I received the text now at this point again. Like, I'm back on that shit. And I, um, and I'm scheduling my text because I just feel like I was too accessible. I feel like people knew it. Too many people knew my move. So even when I do something, I post about that shit a week later or two weeks later. But yeah, Instagram has a scheduling, a way to schedule posts. TikTok has a way to schedule posts. Um, Pinterest has a way to schedule posts. Twitter probably even has a way to schedule. I'm not even on Twitter like that for real. And it's another one. YouTube definitely has a way to schedule posts. So yeah, just because you see me posting, I promise does not mean that I'm actively on social media. Like I swear, my social battery... When, I, when you see me, you see me, and it's great, and it's amazing. And But when I'm a recluse, I'm a recluse, and I need that so that I can be amazing when I'm out, you know? But I feel like I've definitely just had to vocalize that. And, you know, even with newer friendships, like, I definitely, I feel like people kind of understand now. Like, I take weeks to reply. I take days to reply. Sometimes I just need a week to myself, a literal week where I don't talk to anybody, you know? And I love that I have people in my life who don't take that personally. Like, because back in the day, I didn't feel like I, I was safe to do that. And so, and then for the people who do take it personally, that is a thousand percent a personal thing. <laughs> when you take something personal, it's personal on you. You got to deal with that. So yeah, I'm grateful for the people I have in my life now who understand like, oh, Tia, she don't reply for fucking months and she's okay. She's okay. You would feel it in your spirit if she wasn't okay. And I'm grateful for that. So I feel like those boundaries, you know, and friendships have been set in place, but the boundaries in my DMs have not. So I'm just going to start having to actively like not reply to people, leave people unseen, leave people unread. And it just is what it is. Like I cannot, everybody cannot have access to me. I am Beyonce and I'd be forgetting that sometimes. I really do. I genuinely do. Like I am fucking the Beyonce, but a Tia version. All right. Now, before I move on to the last portion where we talk some more about dissociation, because that has been a raging topic on social media. And like I said, it's sad that so many people can relate. So I really just want to be sure to like break it down more and learn more about it and really just educate ourselves so that we can stop because we deserve to be in the moment, you know, during these sexual experiences. But before I do that, I just want to remind you that if you're not signed up for my free pleasure positive email, you can go to levitia.com slash sign up and sign up today. It's free. <laughs> That's it. I send out one email a month for that. And then if you want love notes sent to you monthly, then you can head to levitia.com and go to the ethereal tab. You'll see sign up for the ethereal love notes. And I send out love notes uh, usually three to four times a month uh, for my business, Ethereal by Levitia. It's a vegan hair and skincare company. But yes, I would love for you to receive those as well. So those are two different email blasts and both of them are free to sign up. Now, it's time for dissociation that I've been calling disassociation, but I don't care because everybody knows what I'm talking about, so it doesn't really matter, but for the fuck of it, I'm going to call it dissociation because that's what it says in the article. So this article is called thecouplecenter.org, and it says dissociation during sex, signs, symptoms, and treatment. Let's talk about sex, baby. Physical intimacy enables us to connect with others, experience an ecstatic moment, and take pleasure in the sens sensuality of another body. Sex can be the ultimate expression of romantic love or an emotional roller coaster for some. It's a simple tension reliever used solely to procreate and or just another way of having a good time. During true sexual intimacy, the adult brain is fully activated and your partner feels valued and desires. You want to give and receive pleasure and sexual satisfaction while achieving a deep emotional connection with your partner. Intimate connection, however, is largely a matter of state of mind and habit. Dissociation during sex is a subject matter that gets little attention. It can be triggered by daily stress to fear of intimacy, insecurity, or trauma. Some define it as sexual disconnection from one spouse or partner. So what is dissociation? 
According to Professional Therapist, dissociation and intimacy involves experiencing disconnection from your thoughts and feelings, or even from your location. We often dissociate when we may be in danger and cannot physically remove ourselves from the circumstance. Instead, our mental state comes creates a barrier or technique to help us cope with the pain and trauma related to sexual violence. God damn. Sexual dissociation, sexual dissociation is often manifested in those who have encountered continuous sexual or physical abuse. Hmm, that's interesting as children. A crucial time of physical and mental development. During highly vulnerable situations, these individuals may not be present. Child, this is a mini trigger warning. I had like an epiphany mid like discovery of us talking about dissociation and it's about like childhood abuse um, in regards to like sexual trauma. So if this is a touchy subject for you, please skip five minutes because the rest of this episode is like super, 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 super informative, um, really healing lighthearted but yeah if, if that's something that you're working through um then i feel free to skip five minutes but yeah it's not gonna take up a whole portion of the episode it's just an epiphany i had literally like mid um chat <laughs> about this about this topic of dissociation so yeah but i mean i 10 out of 10 recommend that you listen because it was definitely like a really healing moment for me um i just wanted to be transparent just in case all right love you enjoy um i'm so sorry y'all i just had a flashback to some sexual trauma that i had as a child that i had actually blocked out Um, and I had only remembered when I was 21 years old. Isn't that really like extremely wild? But when I was reading just now before about like the sexual intimacy, I'm sorry, about the fear of intimacy and how like that can stem from childhood sexual trauma, it didn't even put two and two together. Like, and it happened with my friend's brother at the time, like one of my close friend's brothers which is vague because like a lot of my friends had brothers, but like the, I'm not friends with that friend anymore. So I doubt they even listen to my podcast, but yeah, like it's really crazy. I never, I never actually talked about that in real life. I feel like I probably should do a trigger warning, but there's a trigger warning in the beginning. So I feel like that's enough. I don't know. We'll see. But I, um, yeah, I didn't realize that, um, reading this, it just like unlocked it again because I was like, I haven't been like sexually traumatized as a child. And then I was like, Atia, what? Like, it's just really interesting how your brain can, can honestly like block that out and I used to be in programs with people who would very vocally talk about their sexual trauma and I never you know I always felt extreme compassion for them but had had not remembered experiencing my experience until literally 21 years old which is crazy I remember um Iyanla Van Zandt has this quote and she says if somebody asks you if you've ever been sexually assaulted or sexually abused you can't say no You can either say yes or I don't know or I don't remember because your brain can literally block out instances to where you just it seems like you weren't but you you, it's just locked up like you just can't remember for the sake of your protection. So with that being said, this is very interesting. Um, And yeah, a lot to think about, a lot to talk to my therapist about. But and I wanted to to like, I guess, break that to y'all, break that news to y'all in a different way. But I think this is the most organic way that I could really share it, to be honest with you. Um, Because I feel like it's an important factor of my life that, again, because I'm just remembering it seven years ago after it happened when I want to say I was maybe 10. If that, if that. I really don't even think I was 10, to be honest with you. I don't I don't really remember how old I am in certain grades. I can do the math. But yeah, it was it was real bad. Um, OK, so with that being said, that just that that clicked when it said um, the physical or, or or sexual abuse as a child. OK, back to this article and then we can talk about things some more. A crucial time of physical and mental development. Oh, that's the end of that sentence. (laughs) During highly vulnerable situations, these individuals may not be fully present. Use this dissociation to protect themselves and are emotionally detached. Dissociation during sex can cause memory gap. Wow. (laughs) I just said this. Dissociation during sex can cause memory gaps, especially during specific time periods that feel safe or unstable. Uh, That feel unsafe or unstable. Yeah. 
Sex-related disassociation or dissociation exists on a spectrum. Individuals can experience mild forms, including daydreaming, fantasizing, or feeling distracted. More serious types of dissociation during sex include depersonalization and derealization. Health experts define depersonalization as a sense of detachment from your identity and derealization as the world and people around you seem unreal. Yeah, I can relate. I can definitely relate. That's crazy. That's really crazy. Going back to um, what I just shared with y'all about my childhood trauma is what's interesting about it is that it, it, feel, it felt like a dream in a way. I know for sure it happened because I remember like, I remember the details and I remember like, I don't even want to say the feeling, but like, I remember the, I remember, I remember it. I'll just say that. But the unrealness of it all like that like when you really have to protect your mind from from like a memory that's so traumatic that it's like this can't be real right but it was and then you start gaslighting yourself like it that that's actually happened in the majority of my sexual assaults like even um the one that happened at my grandma's memorial like it felt like a fucking dream like it did not feel like it was real at all oh my gosh this is so eye opening we're healing together okay Causes of dissociation during sex. For those who have a history of trauma, sex can trigger and activate a dissociative state. Fear of intimacy can make some subconsciously try to protect themselves from feeling traumatized all over again. Sheesh. Even in trauma or abuse, even if the trauma or abuse occurred decades ago, yeah, the experience may still haunt you in the bedroom. Anxiety can also cause dissociation and intimacy, especially performance anxiety for men. That's interesting. That's very interesting. I wonder if that's why a lot of men are not connected during sex. Issues with one's body image and feelings of insecurity or inadequate around, inadequacy around sex affects both genders. Stress is also a significant cause of dissociation when we do not switch off our minds during sex. Further, stress can affect your ability to become aroused or maintain arousal. Let's review a few examples of what sexual disconnection from your from your spouse or partner looks like. Mind wandering from sexual experience, not feeling connected to one's body, not experiencing physical sensations, struggling to emotionally connect with your partner. Finding help. The good news is dissociation during sex can be managed effectively. You shouldn't deprive yourself of sexual fulfillment. Therapy is key to overcoming dissociation and intimacy. Very true. If you are a survivor of childhood abuse or assault during adulthood, reach out to a qualified mental health provider. Reach out to a qualified mental health provider. If your type of dissociation is unrelated to past trauma, the following recommendations may provide guidance. This is interesting. Sobriety, mm-hmm. discontinued use using drugs and alcohol to stay present in the moment attentive to your partner. The five senses, utilize your ability to see, touch, smell, taste, and hear as fun foreplay games to get you and your partner into the moment. Breath, breathing techniques, which I recommend all the men, re, all the time. Refocus on yourself. If you notice your mind wandering, take time to get settled before you have sex. Mindfulness and meditation may help you battle anxiety or insecurity about sex. Such techniques, such techniques also help you recognize when you're dissociating during sex and emotionally detached. When you sense your mind wandering, practice mindfulness to refocus on the present moment. This is according to someone, Shira Myro. Um, communication is also vital. If you are having a casual or hookup sex, it may not be appropriate to talk about dissociation. That's interesting. I wonder why. I mean, I, I know like you shouldn't overshare, but uh, that's interesting. But you can still communicate ground rules to make safe safer for most enjoyable or more and more enjoyable for both of you. For example, talk about how you want to check in with each other during sex. I love that. Determine if you want to use a safe word to stop at any point. I love that. You and your partner deserve to feel love. Sexual disconnection can come. Sexual disconnection from your spouse or partner shouldn't be anyone's intention. Your mutual desire to support each other will make your love soar. Wow, this was so deep. I feel like I need a hug. You need a hug? Guys, let's put our arms out. Put your arms out. Put your arms out. I'm kidding. And give yourself a hug. Oh, yes. We're okay. We are the world. 
We are the children. We are the ones to make a brighter day. So let's start giving. Living. There's a choice for vacant. I don't know how much I can sing of that without getting sued. So we'll stop right there. But that's my song. Um, I really hope that this episode was healing for you all. I'm definitely going to put another trigger warning in the beginning. But I just feel so like my, my heart chakra is open right now. Like I feel like I can see a little bit. I don't know. It's weird. Like I can see see clearly but at the same time it's muddled i don't know i just feel a lot of compassion for myself because now reading that you know and again going back to just certain trauma that i've had in the past like it all makes sense and i really didn't do myself justice but i forgive myself because i wasn't aware of all of this at the time you know i was recovering from so many other things i was really actively recovering from my relationship i couldn't even figure out anything else and there's even stuff sexually in my relationship that tr- that fucked me up so I'm excited to talk to my therapist about this and excited to decipher um, ways to create safe spaces again. You know, like I said, I have my list of four things. So I'm excited about that and implementing that. But just I'm excited to create safer uh, sexual experiences for myself. And I'm grateful for this pause. Like, I've never been more grateful for celibacy in my life. I really am. Like, my, my heart is really full right now. And I feel really proud of myself. I think that's what I really feel. Like, really proud of myself. And I'm really excited I'm really excited to keep digging deeper about this but i'm grateful for y'all for being here on the journey with me and you know i hope that you had some enlightenment as well and i hope that this really helped you a lot too i feel like we learned a hell of a lot this episode and i love feeling like we learned and i love feeling like i helped facilitate that for myself and for you because even with my therapist the goal is like she her goal one of them is to help me just have more faith in myself And so this is work that we would have done together, you know, and this is is the kind of work that we do in therapy. So for anybody who's interested in therapy, I told you I got the resources. You know, I always recommend Psychology Today, Therapy for Black Girls. But Psychology Today is really my favorite because you can do like exactly what kind of therapist you want. Um, So those would probably be my two biggest recommendations when it comes to therapy. And then even if you don't find a therapist on either of those platforms, you can always meet people on those platforms, get their contact information, schedule a free consultation. And if they're not the ones for you, ask them if they have someone who can help you with this, that, and the third. There's always a resource out there, okay? So I love you so much. Again, don't forget to sign up for my Pleasure Positive email blast. We're actually going to talk some more about this in the email. So yeah, stay tuned. You can download my Pleasure Positive playlist. It's also going to be included in that email blast. And this was great. This was really great. And I know that the next episode is going to be super, super, super amazing. So I'm going to leave it here for right now. And yeah, I, I'm, this, this makes me proud to have this as my 20th episode my heart is so full oh my gosh i could cry i love y'all i love y'all so much thank you for listening and yeah let me know what you thought about this episode email me at the levity experience at gmail.com and tell me what you want to talk about next i love you give yourself a hug again for me and besos